So thank you for joining us today to celebrate the wonderful career and work of Rochelle Thevis, our 37th Master Metalsmith here at the museum. We're facing the end of her exhibition. It's been up since the beginning of October. And I have to say, the reception of this exhibition has really just been inspiring. We've had all types of visitors walk through our galleries and find connection to Rochelle's work um, in multitudes of ways. It's so fun to be in my office beside the gallery where I can hear people of all ages just go, wow, when they see the colors in Rochelle's pieces and the shimmer effect in the shimmer gallery. Um, and I'm sure that you'll get, get a bit of that today. Rochelle Thevis has a BA from Southern Illinois University Carbondale, where you studied with Brent Kington famously. Yes. Her father is a master engraver, and so she comes by her skill set naturally, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'll hear more about her own biography during this talk, so I won't I won't give away too much, um, but I will say that it's just been incredible to get to know Rochelle in this capacity of my role here and to watch others engage with and learn from her work and her career um, in teaching at University of Texas El Paso for so many decades, even though you're a young, <laughs> not to age you, but yeah, for decades. And just to see how uh, solid roots that are planted can really put forth a fount of um, young students and ideas and engagement. So it's been really wonderful to be a part of this. Um, I'm going to turn over this presentation to Rochelle and I'll quickly assist with screen sharing and getting the presentation up and then we'll both unmute and Rochelle will begin her talk. Okay, so, so. Um, thank you all for joining me today. I really appreciate you um, spending some time. And before I start, I really would like to thank the Metal Museum for, and the staff um, for giving me this wonderful honor of being the master metalsmith and the opportunity to, to have a retrospect of my work. That's, it's been pretty terrific, actually. So um, thanks to all of them. They've been wonderful. So today, I'm going to read a little bit as I'm talking at Oh, I'm going to read a little bit and I'm just going to not be reading and and uh, just sort of talking off the top of my head a little bit. But um, and I'm going to show you work not really in a chronological order. I'm, I'm actually going to be starting with my painted work, which is the most recent. So here you see a, an image of me when I'm a, a little kid. So I was raised in a, a really small Midwestern farm community and making things was a really big part of our childhood. The idea of doing something creative every day was instilled in us kids by both my mother and my father. And um, as you can see here, I really loved adorning whatever I was wearing for the day with jewelry, lots of jewelry. Um, As Laura mentioned earlier, my father was a, a hand engraver. So my early education in metal came from spending hours watching my father hand engrave jewelry, hollowware, flatware, guns, and trophies. Um, every e almost every evening, actually, I would pull a chair up um, to his bench and sit and watch him engrave all kinds of really amazing objects. And every once in a while, he'd let me handle something which was pretty terrific. Um, and I think better than that, my dad would sit and patiently answer question after question about how the pieces were made and how his engraving enhanced and gave meaning to, to all of these pretty beautiful pieces. So the piece on the right is a brooch that he made for me in the early 90s. And it's... Um, it's, it's a piece that's been engraved and carved out of silver. And from the photograph on the left, of, and the photograph on the left is, I'm 22 years old, and it was my graduation um, photograph from Southern Illinois University. And it was really kind of a tongue-in-cheek photograph. My, my father always loved the picture. And, um, you know, 15 years later, so he made this really wonderful brooch for me.
So my mom, um, you know, was pretty important in my life too. And she, so here's a picture of me. I'm probably, I don't know, four years old, something like that, maybe five. And we're, I'm standing outside of our house that was newly built. And she designed and made all of my clothing and her clothing. And that meant that she made my hats. She made everything. In fact, I'm looking at the purse in this picture and I'm thinking she probably made that too. Um, so she was really pretty important in my sense of, of fashion and my sense of jewelry as well. And I know I would go to school and, and, and I'd come back home and I would say, but mom, the other kids aren't wearing this, you know, why don't you make me, you know, something that the other kids are wearing and she'd always say but you're not everybody else you know you are you have to think of yourself as a unique being and that means visually too so she really got me to buy into this idea of of being very unique in my visual self um and which has continued actually to this day so the the picture on the right is is fairly recent, and um, you know I I make jewelry and I I love wearing the jewelry too, and it's really important to me that once I make this work that can be kind of demanding to wear that I take it out for test drives, so and that I really think about how I'm going to wear it, um, with the clothing that I'm going to wear it with, like what's going to show that work off the best. So I'm going to talk a little bit then today about my art practice and the materials that I use and have used over the years, the process, and importantly, the body. So my student years were a deep dive into non-metal materials and exploration of the body. Although the work was about the body, wearability was not a primary cons consideration. Uh, upon graduating, I, um, I left all that behind and began working within traditional forms of jewelry, including necklaces, bracelets, brooches, and earrings. And let's see here, there we go. So this is part of my graduate thesis work. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a full size corset piece that um, has steel sections on it, a little bit of silver and then lots of fabrics. And actually once you were, once you were put into the piece, you couldn't sit down. So it really controlled body, body movements. So, um, and the picture before that, this is just a little bit out of, out of order, I guess. There, thank you so much, Laura. Um, but so I graduate with my MFA from Kent State University and within a month, literally a month, I was teaching in El Paso. And so here's El Paso. This is what I, you know, I, I went from the Midwest and, and I landed in El Paso. This, really wonderful place of desert and mountains. Um, so very different from where I'd spent my um, youth growing up and where I had been in school. Um, and I have to say that my artwork changed overnight. It very heavily became influenced by the austere landscape of the desert and the mountains and the visually and culturally colorful El Paso Juarez border made a, a pretty strong impression on me and does to this day. Okay. So um, El Paso is uh, it's home to a really strong lowrider culture. Um, that was brand new to my eyes when I arrived there in 1976 to teach. A few weeks after landing at the border, I saw and fell in love with my, my first beautifully painted car. And I've really held this low rider fascination for years. I love going to car shows. Uh, I go quite often and I go, I kind of go everywhere. I might be out in California at a car show, just wherever. And um, I just, I love seeing the tricked out autos with their candy and pearl and chameleon paints laid onto their um, voluminous and sleek metal forms. couple pictures. So I like to photograph the cars and I, I um, photograph them for inspiration, really. Um, 
Um, so about 15 years ago, I decided it was finally time to tackle these specialty paints. Um, so, and like vintage automobiles, my jewelry uses steel as a base material to which the paint is then applied. So this is a, a bracelet that happens to be in the exhibition here at the Metal Museum, and it has a pretty wonderful chameleon paint on it. And as you uh, move around the piece, you're gonna see a range of maybe up to 10 different colors, um, depending on how the light is hitting it. So um, a lot of the paints do, they shift and they produce a large range of color. Oh, we, we can go ahead, yeah. Um, so, Anyway, here's a picture of my studio, and and this is um, this is after the piece is made. I am looking at all these color chips by all these different. I shouldn't say all these different, but there's a handful of specialty companies here and in Europe that handle these particular kinds of paints, and um, so I work with the chips, and then sometimes I. Um, I spray that or I have them sprayed onto these little model forms that are called speed shapes. Anyway, this is this is what I'm looking at when I'm trying to figure out the colors for a piece. And it's the most difficult thing to do. The, the building the piece is not such a big deal. It's trying to figure out what colors are going to be the best for the piece that I'm working on. So um, we can go next. So invariably, this is what I'm looking at. I've got a color chip and I'm I'm laying it against the piece uh, in various ways. I'm taking it outside, looking at it in the sunlight. Um, and and I might have a few more paints that I uh, that are chips and stuff that I'm looking at as well. So I might have two, three, four, five different chips there that I'm have laid on the piece and I'm trying to figure out. Will they work together? What will they do when they're placed next to each other? Will they will they change the colors uh, to maybe a new color that I would like for them to be when they're placed side by side? What will happen? So um, this particular bracelet, then uh, we have an image of it that is finished off. So it's, it starts in the raw form, then I work with the samples and then then in the end, and so this is um, this paint here is a couple of candies, and then another paint that has a pretty wonderful prism built into it for the the largest part of the piece. And so, um, so you know the the light will force the color to bounce, and at times sometimes you can get two or three colors to blend and make a different color. So like maybe two or three candies that will blend and make a certain color together. Every now and then, too, um, besides working with just the uh, the the paints um, that come you know from the companies, I'll take two or three paints and make a new paint out of it, a new color. So okay. So I have a few images here of painted works that have been done over the years. And like I mentioned before, um, I do work in very traditional forms of jewelry from, earrings, bracelets, uh, necklaces, brooches. The piece that you're seeing right now actually just got finished in my studio, so. Um, that's kind of the direction I'm moving in right now with the work. So, okay, nuns. Um, I went to Catholic grade school until I was in fourth grade. And I just thought the nuns, they had the best costumes, the very best costumes. And um, in fact, I thought, oh, well, if I could wear one of those habits that they were one of the costumes that they're wearing, maybe I would um, think about being a nun because... It was just so cool. But um, the other thing that I noticed is that they had this great jewelry that they wore. And the jewelry being the rosaries that they tied to their waist and, and wore on the side. And at the school that I went to, um, unlike the nun that you're seeing in the picture here, the crucifix always was really long and it hung down by the by the ankle and I loved watching the nuns walk down the hallway with it 
and how the the um the rosary and the crucifix would just swing with their gait. I thought that was quite interesting. And so I um at home one day then I we had rosaries and I tied them around my waist and but they were short rosaries and they didn't they just kind of bounced around. They just weren't long enough and I expressed to my dad, I think he asked, you know, what's what's the problem here? Why are you walking around with this rosary on? And um, I said, well, I want to be like the nuns. I, you know, I, I want to see what that feels like. And our rosaries aren't long enough here in the house. And he took me out to the garage and he got a rope. He tied it around my waist and he put a rock down on the end of it. And he said, here, go walk with it. And so, you know, I was I was probably in about first or second grade when I did that. And I always remembered that experience. And um, so down the road, many, many, many years later, I decided to, to play with that idea and to take the, take the pendant, which usually hangs around the breasts on a female body, and to drop that really low and to drop it lower than the waist. So that when someone was actually um, walking, they would feel the, the pendant and to move forward. There, there's two of them here that we're going to see. They would be able to feel that pendant move from hip to hip, back and forth, upper leg to upper leg, back and forth as they walked. And the pieces are very kinetic. Everything moves. And so there's the sound that you hear of your body moving. But more importantly, you, you that pounding on the body, you're feeling the rhythm of your movement with these pieces. So the, these um, necklaces were called all reflections of St. Mary's and and probably my first um you know the first idea that jewelry could be something a little bit different than what what I was normally seeing um was and and this idea that I could explore jewelry a little bit and how you wore it um actually happened when I was probably about six or seven years old so let's move on there Walking is really important to me. I spend um, a lot of time going out on hikes and stuff. So walking in the desert requires a lot of tenacity and careful navigation. Um, you need to stay alert as it's really easy to be impaled by the cactus or scraped from a hard rock. And always there's a need to be on the look lookout for rattlesnakes and coyotes. Um, we can move forward there. So this is the desert in El Paso. Uh, you know, it's it's so very, very beautiful, but it also is, um, it's a rather dangerous place as well. It can be. Move to the next slide. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, and and I have to say too, I, I I love to go. My husband and I go hiking kind of everywhere. I mean, we spend a lot of time in the UK hiking as well. And I really um, I love to experience the different land landscapes and and also how I have to think about how I'm walking so that I don't um, hurt myself. Um, the um, the experience of the desert and the mountains walking led to making jewelry that controlled body and made sounds announcing the wearer's presence. So um, just real quickly back on the other image there, I'm just share a little story with you. I'd spent a month um, hiking in the UK and it was wonderfully beautiful. I didn't have to worry about rattlesnakes or cacti um, or hard rocks. In fact, when I would slip and fall, I would fall on heather, which was kind of wonderful. Um, there's other things you have to worry about there, but we came back to El Paso and we went out hiking early one morning on what you see here, pretty hard rock, um, but in an area where there was a lot of cacti as well. And within about 45 minutes, I had, I had slipped and fallen, I don't know, three or four or five times. And I was just bloody as I'll get out. And I started to laugh the last time I fell and my husband said, what are you laughing about? You look, yeah, you've got blood everywhere because I was hitting the cacti and whatever. And I said, you know, 
I'm not paying attention to where I'm walking. We've been in the UK and it's been a different kind of landscape that I've been traversing and I knew how to move with it. And we've come back here and I haven't paid attention to, to the landscape that I know really well. I, um, and, and because of that, I'm falling. So anyway, um, I, because of all this walking and the landscape, we'll move on to the next one, great. Um, I started to make work that really did control the body um, and, and how the body moves. So this obviously is a really long brooch. The photograph is, um, is about the size of the person that I photographed there. And the ends of the brooch just stick into the fabric. And if you're not careful with how you move, um, you might end up piercing your, your um, skin a little bit. So, but that will make you change your movements a bit and how you hold yourself. So, and here we have a um, really long necklaces that drape across the body and um, make you throw your shoulders back and keep your feet straight ahead. And if you do that, your knees are straight ahead too. And, and actually it's really quite easy to walk in this really long necklace. If you think about, about your body and how your body is moving, the necklace will move quite lovely um, with you. But if you, you know, forget about that. And maybe if you start walking and your feet are kind of pointing out, which most of us do most of the time when we walk, the necklace fights against the body a bit. So, um, I've spent a lot of time over the years doing work that that really makes you think about um, how you're wearing it and how your body is moving in order to not damage the piece or damage yourself. So. Let's see. So. Okay, I think we can move on to the next one too. So music has been a huge um, part of my life. My husband is a musician. So um, next image. So we have a room that's full of records, lots of records. We also have a room that's full of CDs and we have rooms that are full of 48s and 68s and whatever. Um, and uh, so I, I, do listen to music all the time and um the music has really uh made me think about um about order and rhythm and chaos and things like that so um i also questioned how i could dramatically change the visual composition of jewelry when the body was in motion and so an intense study of john coltrane's music really help shape and inform ideas of order and chaos and sound that I was looking for. Just listening to him and and his um, whatever band it was that he was playing with. And um, I was real mesmerized by how his band at times would be his rhythm section. They would They would lay down a really great rhythm and he would play on top of it and sometimes um, kind of just go off on these tangents that were not very melodic at all. And, but I often would wonder, you know, how, you know, how did he manage to sort of pull all that together and have some order in the music as well as chaos in the music. And this particular necklace is called Echoes and Rhythms of Train. And it's the piece where I think I fully started to understand um, from a visual perspective, what John Coltrane was doing with his music. And on this particular piece, the backside looks very much like what you're looking at right here. Um, I think there's another, no, I guess that's it. Um, and um, I wanted to have a piece that was visually, you know, somewhat chaotic looking, but I, in order to actually make that piece, I had to figure out an underlying structure that had a real patterned order to it. Um, this particular piece is made out of of um, sterling and uh, and some 18 karat yellow gold and a bit of slate. Um, 
So silver became my primary material for quite a long time. And with it, those of you that, that work in the field um, and work with metal, you know that what comes with that is fire scale. And it's a real problem that's due to overheating the metal by soldering or other heat processes. Um, when I was younger, I, I, and I, at this time period, I felt like I was pretty much an expert in that department, getting fire scale. Um, and my frustrations, though, was trying to deal with that slowly developed into a curiosity about it. And through a long period of experimentation, I was eventually able to control the fire scale and to create a rich black and white pattern on the silver surface through basically um, burning it and, and removing it. So the patterning, to me, brought um, forth a really seductive quality to the aggressive hollow forms that I was using in my jewelry at the time. This is a brooch that's probably about eight inches in, in, um, in length. Next one. And a bracelet that that when it's on and it um, is in, if it lays out flat, it's about 12 inches, I would say, something like that. Um, let's see the next image. Okay, let's see. Before, can we go back to the last one? Okay, thank you. So, um, so you're seeing a little bit of slate in these pieces here. And my, my dad did teach me some basics of engraving. Uh, actually, I was even given three hours of college of university credit by taking an engraving class with him one summer. Uh, Brent Kington did that for me, which was pretty wonderful. But I've really never used the process on metal, hardly at all. But in the, the late 80s and the early 90s, um, I took the gravers up and uh, my skill set is fairly limited with them. But what I ended up using them for was to carve slate. And on this particular bracelet, you can see a little bit of patterning on it. And I think you might see that maybe in the future, a few more pieces that I'm gonna show. But those patterns were made with the hand engravers that my dad um, gave me and showed me how to use, just carving into the slate. So, okay, next. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm always looking for structures too like what's what are the perfect structures what are the perfect finds and my structures and finds come from nature um that's where i'm always looking so we can move on to the next image i think yeah this is is a wall in my studio so on my hikes um over the years i sometimes find things that i think are quite interesting structurally and i i bring them back into my studio and hang them on the wall. And this is just one, one section of a wall with some of my finds that I have. Next image. Actually, one of these is on the wall that we just saw, but this is a Chilean pine. And um, it was, I found this tree when I was hiking in the UK and it was, it was such a great thing to find um, because I had been thinking about some jewelry that I wanted to make, and but I just couldn't figure the structure out. Like, how was I going to make everything move so so nice on the pieces? And when I saw this tree and the plant structure of the leaves, I thought, ah, that's how I'm going to do it. So um, got back home from from our hiking trip, and I went right into the studio and I started to build um, some of these pieces. This is called Ring of Thorns, and so the the um, the long pieces that splay out are I think that there's like over 300 pieces of hollow silver hammered forms there, and um, they they just move really nicely. And the inner structure that holds them together was pulled from that plant structure that I saw while I was hiking. Let's see next image. There we go. And here's a, another example of using that structure, and another example of of the slate um, that happens to be carved on both sides. Each disc is carved on both sides with my graving tools. Um, 
so the first slate that I ever found and became intrigued with came from my backyard in El Paso. I was digging a hole up for a plant and I found a few shards of slate. I don't know why they were there. The roof on our house did not have a slate roof, um, but I took it in the studio and, and I thought, I wonder what I could do with this. And I wonder if I can saw it without using um, stone working tools. And sure enough, I could drill it and I could saw it. And that was pretty wonderful. And that started me on uh, probably a decade of, of integrating slate into my work. Um, but one of the best things uh, that happened is that on one of our trips to Wales, I was taken to a slate fa factory in Festinyog. And it was just great because um, they actually, they cut the discs out for me. And that was pretty wonderful. They just gave me a whole box of discs that were cut out because I've been cutting them out by hand and filing the edges and then, you know, um, sanding them down to get the right thickness. I still had to sand all the discs down to the right thickness, but it was just so great to have somebody else cut them out. And this was before I had access to water jet or um, laser cutting and stuff. So, okay move on to the next one um and so th this this is also from my hikes and from that you know looking at structures and looking at structures in nature now this was man-made but this this too came from uh from one of my hikes in scotland up on top of this mountain and i just loved how the the bottom part of the wall most of the wall actually was built in, in what would be considered pretty random, you know, pretty uh, chaotic in a way. And then that they put all these rocks upright on the top and created this nice order. And I thought it was such a beautiful um, contrast of the idea of order and chaos, something that I had, was working with and exploring in my own work. You know, here I found it right out in nature, man-made man nature. So, um, so after the echoes and rhythms of train necklace, where it was visually very chaotic to look at that piece, um, I started doing several pieces that when you, when you just, when they were still, you could see the order very clearly, but then when they were on the body and the body moved, the order disappeared. And, but then if the body, so for instance, this bracelet on the right, you can see a little bit of movement, all of a sudden, all that order just changes. And um, because it is so kinetic as the person is wearing it, it, the pieces just fly around. But if the arm comes down to rest next to the, um, on the side of the body, all the order appears again. So I spent quite a bit of time doing work that um, played with that idea and that idea of body motion and what the body how the body might change a piece. Okay. So um, I've been very interested in light for several decades too. And it hasn't always figured into my work, but quite a bit of the time it has, particularly, obviously the painted work, light is really important as well as body movement. And I'm, I'm interested in all kinds of light, you know, the warm light, Cool light, soft, harsh magic. Um, and we have a few pictures here that I, so when I'm out walking in the morning, I'm always taking pictures of what I see. This is down at the end of my street, it was one morning. Um, this is out in the desert where they're doing a lot of construction and building a lot of manufactured um, buildings out there. And this was early one morning. I thought the sunlight was really interesting against the um the architecture of this building and then you also you just sort of never know what you're going to find with light you know sometimes you find something and and you don't really know what you're you know what you're looking at but you don't really know what you're looking at so I'm always taking those kinds of pictures and thinking about light and and kind of dreaming about how I can utilize light in work in the Late 90s, early 2000s, I did a series of work called Shimmer, and light was was what I was playing with, actually. And I, I really wanted to um, integrate the light that I saw where I lived in the desert um, the, and at, during different times of the year. So um, in my 
environment in El Paso in the summertime, it's not only is it really hot, but the sunlight is really, really bright. And I found early on living there that looking at the mountains in the middle of, say, early in the morning until about the middle of the day was really hard on my eyes. It was like hearing nails on a blackboard, you know, when you were a kid and, and they use blackboards, they don't use them anymore, but and you might hear um, fingernails, you know, happen to scratch a blackboard and, and it made that sharp noise. Well, I felt that the light in the desert on the mountains were like that to my eyes. But I knew if I waited until maybe four or five o'clock in the afternoon in the summer, then the light just changed dramatically. And it was really very sensuous light. So I, um, I wanted to play with that idea of sort of the range of light that I had experienced over the years next image yeah and so um but once again you know I had to figure out how I was going to do that and uh a couple hours away from where we live is a place called Cloudcroft New Mexico and we like to go up there hiking a lot and in the fall there's these beautiful aspen trees that of course turn up lovely color of yellow um so we were up there hiking and I was thinking about what am I going to do with light? How am I going to make this happen? And there was a nice wind that was moving the leaves on the trees and the leaves were dried out just enough. And I thought it was amazing how they were capturing this sort of bathing light, soothing light, and then this sharp shrieking light, light um, just because the of the wind and the movement. So um got home and went in the studio and and I thought I know exactly what I'm going to do and I started to explore and experiment with how to make that happen so um the shimmer jewelry came out of that can move on to the next image there we go and we can just kind of go through these images here so um the structures are made out of 18 karat palladium white gold and because it gave me the perfect white, I thought. And then the discs are made out of sterling silver. And the, the structures are a polished surface. The, the round discs are um, a satin finish, a sanded satin finish. And so that also helped with um, the, the trying to explore these different ideas of light. And as I mentioned before, I do test run all my work. I um, I want to see what happens when they're on the body. And so the next image is a picture of me wearing some of the earrings from this particular series. Okay, so then the other stuff, other stuff that I do, um, other stuff that's part of my life and part of my practice. So I, I have a collaborative group that I work with. It's actually just myself and another artist, Susie Davidoff. And we've been working collaboratively since 1999. We've even had a museum retrospect show of our work. And um, so, um, but, and sometimes other people join us in or join with us. Um, so we occasionally do projects where somebody else, uh, we invite somebody else to work with us. Next image. Let's see. Um, so we our artworks include uh, books, installation, drawing, sculpture, video, photography, sound, um, performance, uh, jewelry, just a range of things. And when we have time, we get together and we work on a new project. The project, uh, the image on the right, is from a project we've been working on the last, I guess, about three years, four years, and it's going a lot of different directions at this point. So um, it's been it's been a really um, fun way of expanding my art practice, actually, over the years. Next image. So um, as Laura said earlier, I, I taught at the university for a really long time, and I, I retired from there in 2014, actually. Um, I started out pretty young. I was 24 when I started out at the university. So it was time just to focus on my um, on my art practice a little bit more heavily than when I was able to do so when I was teaching. But I created a couple of endowments when I left. Um, I uh, created one for the for the um, the the metals faculty, and then I created an endowed 
scholarship. So some university medal programs have closed in recent years. Many of you perhaps realize that, um, especially as faculty retire. So there's always fear and talk of others eventually closing down as well. And fortunately, my art colleagues found value in the medals program and its integration into basically a fine arts department. So when I retired, that's why I decided that I wanted to keep all of this going. And, um, and it, it could certainly help if I would create a couple of endowments at, at the university for the art department and for the medals program and for the faculty who run, runs the program. So, um, so when I came to, um, to El Paso to run the medals program at the university, of Texas El Paso. The university does sit directly across from the US-Mexico border. Juarez, Mexico is right across the street from it. And our students come from both sides. And this location brings a really rich cultural history and experience to their thought process. Um, daily life in this cross-border community is often dissected and printed on the artwork that they create. Um, I was fortunate over the years that so many exceptional artists were brought through the medals program, including Beverly Penn and Ida Alonzo and, um, and Karen Karch. And their work has gone so many different directions. Some of you might know of Beverly. She does these really fabulous sculptural works um, and, um, and, you know, Karen Karch is she's in New York City and she um, she's gone more of a fine jewelry route with her work and I'm so um, fortunate to have had such wonderful students come through my program and go to so many different directions with their work over the years. So um, I also collect work and so in 1980 the piece on the left there I purchased my first piece of another artist jewelry. Um, from Edward DeLarge, his really incredible titanium work. And um, starting then, I began to collect jewelry from all over the world in earnest as a way to study and understand other artists thinking about this art form. I've financed collecting over the years from the sales of my own jewelry. The collection also became an important teaching tool. Um, El Paso is geographically isolated. My students did not have the opportunity to see current work that often. And so during the semester, I would bring parts of the collection into the studio for the students to handle and to for us to discuss. Um, in recent years, I would say in the last 10 years, I made a commitment to purchase only work made by young American jewelers. Um, I, I think that it's hard to keep making experimental work um, if it's not purchased occasionally. And I, I believe that the younger artists in particular need validation and encouragement for their efforts. And so, so that's why I made this conscientious decision to only buy American work and, and younger artists. Um, so my most recent piece is this pretty great cameo piece with um, that was made by Nicole deschamps Benke for me. She agreed to do, and I, just think it's it literally came into my studio maybe a month ago, so I'm I'm pretty excited about it. And then my um, the last thing I wanted to talk about my last image here is that I there's another collaborative project that I work on that I've been doing for a while, and it's it's a pretty unusual project that I'm part of. Uh, there's a collector in Arizona of primarily fine art that came to me several years ago with an interesting proposal. Uh, he's somebody who had purchased my work in the past, even though um, he mostly you know, purchased paintings and sculpture, but um, he lost his wife and who was a real jewelry lover. And in her memory, he wanted to annually purchase one of my pieces to be gifted to a former student of my choosing. We've done this now for six or seven years. And um, his hope is that it will inspire these artists to keep working in whatever their current art form might be. So this last year, last summer, uh, Laura Quinones was the recipient. Well, actually two summers ago. Um, 
there's been one since then. And this is what she, she wrote a note to me, but then she also wrote this on Instagram. And um, as she said there, well, actually the note that she wrote to me and to the collector, she said, I just received your beautiful gift. I'm beyond grateful. They came at the perfect time. There are days that I doubt if, if it is worth all the work and effort I invest in some of my pieces. I will cherish these earrings forever. So anyway, thank you all for um, listening. Well, thank you, Rochelle. And I can see that um, some of you have your cameras on and uh, some do not, but I think that we can all give a hearty virtual round of applause for such a wonderful talk. And uh, there were some some interesting, I still, every time we talk, I learn from you. And there were new pieces and new pictures and new ideas that you were sharing. So thank you for that, for continuing to expand our horizon here at the Metal Museum and with our Metal Museum community across the country. Um, I do want to give an opportunity for questions, maybe one or two short questions, and I'll ask that you either raise your hand or put it in the chat, and then I'll, I'll unmute you or read your question aloud if you have questions now. I really thought I would take a little less time, but I guess we got started a little late too. So. We did, okay. and that's the <laughs> technology. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Um, what is from Suzanne Henry? Uh, what is your underlying process for the steel in your painted work? And I'll unmute you. Okay, sure. Um, here we go. Is that good? Okay. Okay. So. Um, because of the collaborative work that I do, I um, we did a large installation piece early on, and it it forced me to explore water jet cutting because we did some pieces that were over eight feet um, wall pieces, and um, that was a great thing. That was quite a long time ago, back when I was doing the Shimmer series. So I was punching all of those silver discs out back in the day, and then I thought geez, I should be having these water jet cuts. So this is probably in about 1999, something like that. And so I gave a sheet of sterling to my water jet cutter and um, had him cut those pieces out for me, which, which saved so much time, saved a tremendous amount of time by having those cut. And then I, I just had to do, you know, finish work on them, sand the edges and stuff like that. And but because of that, the work that I do in the in the steel, um, I do use a the same water jet cutter to cut things out for me um, to a degree. But I also have really large kind of semi-industrial saws in my studio where I cut pieces also. So I'm, I'm working with um, cold rolled steel uh, in tubular form and flat sheet form. Um, I like the cleanliness of it and I like the strength of it. The pieces then get soldered together, high temperature soldered together. So I'm using uh, easy, medium, hard solder. And, um, and then they get painted. I do not do the painting on my work myself. So um, when I first started studying as, as a student, you know, we had very little ventilation, if any ventilation in the studios, and I soldered on asbestos for several years before they decided asbestos was terrible for us. And um, and that went out of the studios. I also worked with resins back in the in the early 70s for quite a bit when there wasn't, once again, any ventilation. Consequently, over the years, I've just... Um, realize that my lungs can't take um, fumes anymore. And with so I even working with glues, if I work with glues for more than a couple minutes, I take them outside. I put uh, I have a chemical respirator on anyway, but I take them outside. I just and I, I have goggles on and um, 
everything because it, I, I can feel it in my body right away, any of the fumes. So I found a painter to work with. Um, I've had a couple of different painters that I've worked with over the years, but Asher Emerson from um, Chandler, Arizona is who I've been working with for over 10 years now. And we work really closely together. I, I physically go visit him um, a few times a year. We, we do, um, we create colors together. I will sometimes um, send him different things like like flower petals and I'll say I want a chameleon that shifts from this color to this color do you think you can make it can we do it can we explore that or I like these two paints here let's put 25 percent of this one in and 75 of this one and spray that out for me what's that look like so we work really really closely together he works in an eighty thousand dollar spray bay, spray um, booth and um and I realized that in order for myself to um do the spraying I would I would need a you know, pretty big spray booth like that. Um, and on top of that, I would probably hazmat myself up too. I'd wear a hazmat suit. So I just can't, my lungs can't take it anymore. It was a very hard thing for me to do to give something up to somebody else because I've been building all this work all these years. Um, but we we have a great relationship working together. And I um, he really believes in the work that I do, which is very important to me. So I hope that kind of asks, answers that question sort of yeah thank you I can I can see that there's a comment from Bob Evendorf so Bob I'll ask you to mm -hmm. unmute you may have a little button come up that says confirm am I on now hello oh just a second I'm so sorry oh, yeah. okay hey Bob hi <laughs> It's, it's been such a joy to be with you and hear your story. And also, to, as a former academia person myself, I want to acknowledge your gift to so many young ones who have gone out into the field and have found their way. And it was you who put those cornerstones of curiosity a few techniques, and also open them up to other makers globally with your collection. Um, it is such a joy to see at this time in your life that we are finding time to celebrate what you have gifted to so many. Uh, I know when I sit at the workbench every day and break a saw blade, I get a big smile to keep on the path, lean into it, and thank you for your many beautiful pieces that have found their way to museums to be looked at and to be celebrated. And also the many collectors who have been there and worked with you over the years. So it's such a joy to be in your presence and know of the footprint and the technical skills that you shared and passed on. Much gratitude. Thank you so, so much, Bob. Um, you, of course, have been important in my life, too. You were one of those jewelers that I, as a youngster, looked up to. And, and I have to say, I have a Bob Eppendorf piece in my collection, too, that I cherish. Okay. Uh... Oh, 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 sorry, oh, sorry Bob. Bob, I think you're muted again. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, okay. I, see I see a, a thumbs, thumbs up. up. I do I have some have nice comments, comments for Rochelle, Rochelle in the chat, in the and, chat and I'll be sure, sure to share these share with her at the end. Um, um, for the for sake of time, uh, Harriet and Judy have asked a couple questions. I'll end with Judy's because it's looking forward to what's next, but Harriet has asked if you could please talk about getting your work in the museum collection and the impact, the impact of the of pandemic, pandemic on your work. Oh, okay. So which museum collection? This one here? Or at the Bill Metal Museum or? Vienna. Uh, maybe, maybe in general, maybe in general, general because Bob did reference. reference. How, 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 how your, your, your okay. work is dispersed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I'm, I'm so very, very fortunate to have 
have a lot of work in museum collections. Um, I, I always say that, you know, if when I'm gone, if there's work that's not, that's still around, it's going to end up on the yard sale table, you know? And so um, I, I, I'm just feel so um, blessed that many museums have, have acquired work. Sometimes pieces have gone into museum collections because of, of um, collectors that have gifted them. Sometimes I have sold work directly to museums and, um, and sometimes a museum has asked for a piece directly from me and I have gifted it to the museum. So it's kind of all different uh, ways that they maybe get something into their collection. Um, and uh, recently the Houston Fine Art Museum acquired a piece, which I'm really quite thrilled to have a piece in Texas, besides the El Paso Museum of Art, um, and into that particular collection. And that came through a collector that donated it. I th there was a question about what's happening in the future. Is that? Um, well, she had also asked about um, your making during the pandemic. Oh, the, yes. Um, you know, that was a really kind of an interesting time because um, uh, so my show at the Metal Museum was supposed to be in fall of 2021 and then the pandemic happened and everything got shifted and all of their shows got shifted. And I have to say that it was a disappointment for just a very short period of time because I, you know, I was working hard towards that show, but it was a gift in the end. It was a wonderful gift to me because I was a runner. I used to run every single day. And shortly after, about a week or two after I got that phone call, I was running and I fell and I, I severely broke my right shoulder. And so um, I spent a lot of the pandemic um, trying to get my shoulder back working again. And, um, and in a way, then it was kind of wonderful because it gave me even more time to think about this exhibition. And this exhibition in my head changed a bit. Like I, I did some things a little bit differently. And um, so I wasn't able to make a lot of work. I, I had to focus on my shoulder during the pandemic time. And I, have, I did eventually start making some work. And I think at first, I really thought I was going to do a bunch of work. I was going to use paint, but I was going to I was thinking about black, <laughs> you know, I just um, sort of stuff that I could do with the color black I, was sort of intrigued me. But I think because of, I think because the pandemic got compounded for me with this shoulder issue. And I, I mean, I, I it was about nine months trying to get my shoulder back that um, when I finally started making work, I just threw all kinds of color on it you know it just it was I was it was such a, a you know to get my shoulder back working again and we were starting to come out of the pandemic a little bit I just saw so much light there you know and kind of a lot of happiness and a, and a lot and me being really grateful for a lot of things I mean how you I was grateful I broke my shoulder I guess because my show had been postponed and so it gave, as my husband said to me, when I came in and, and I, after breaking the shoulder, like the next day, he said, you know, there's something really good about this, Rochelle. That's all he said. And I said, I know, I know it's a good thing that show got postponed. <laughs> and he said, yeah. Okay, I'm going to end with one last question. This was up earlier in the chat, but I think it's a great question to end with. Judy Kasten has asked, what's next for you? Oh so my God. Okay. So I'm, I'm there we go. Okay. I'm not so good at, I'm good at listening to zoom. I'm not good at doing it, but, um, so of course, um, actually right now I'm working on some necklaces, but I have, I have, um, a new challenge ahead that I'm very excited about. In June of 2025, I will have a solo exhibition at the El Paso Museum of Art. And, um, and the, this piece right here on the screen will be part of that exhibition. And it's just focusing on my painted work. And um, the challenge being that I have um, a space that's 7,500 square feet with 24 foot ceilings to work with. 
and I'm I'm hoping to uh, I'd like to keep maybe maybe only have 50 to 60 pieces in that humongous space, but I will be also um, showing in unusual ways a lot of the car images that I've taken over the years and because the space is so big we can do projections and we can wrap we can wrap walls and pedestal bases and everything so it's a um it's a huge challenge that I'm uh, very excited and um slightly nervous about basically the work is almost done I have one more piece to get finished up for it which will be finished soon and then um then all the work um I'll be focusing on just designing the show out so that's what's happening okay well I'll leave this beautiful image up on the screen for everyone here to get one last look at before it disappears into the ethernet, the, the internet ether. I mean, um, I did want to say thank you to Arts Memphis, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and of course, the Wingate Foundation for the incredible support that we've had um, during this duration of the exhibition and throughout our year, every year at the Metal Museum. Um, thank you again to Rochelle for such a wonderful talk and a wonderful exhibition. It's just been an honor really to be able to share your work with so many others. So if you feel like you'd like to try to, um, uh, I guess you'd have to do the, the hand clap emoji on your <laughs> on your Zoom one more time before we say goodbye. Um, and if you'd like to put any uh, sentiments in the chat, I'm certainly going to share that Rochelle with, with Rochelle when this, this is done. Thank you again, everyone for your attendance and uh, be on the lookout for more virtual artist talks on the horizon. Um, more to come. We are opening up a radical jewelry exhibition, radical jewelry artist project, radical jewelry makeover, the artist project. Uh, February 4th, it opens here at the Metal Museum. And Rochelle has actually been a part of that artist project in addition to Razzie's so yeah. quite active. Um, so please be uh, on the lookout for more opportunities to engage with metal smithing and jewelry and all of the wonderful um, aspects of our programming here. So thank you again, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.